he's keen to have the laser pointer. And when you hear that Jean-Marie wants to have a laser pointer, you can be absolutely sure that he will use it <laughs> extensively in his lecture. But the lectures that we will have a chance to witness will be based on imagination. And imagination is more important than knowledge, because knowledge is limited, but imagination encircles the world. That's what Albert Einstein said. The world is changed by those who can use the imagination, who can come up with an original idea, shape the idea, and work hard to make sure that from the idea there is something in the real world. These people are shaping and changing the world. Today, you will meet three distinguished scientists who received some of the highest honors in the world, who definitely used their imagination, who definitely did work hard, and who definitely help to change the world. They will describe what they were and are working on, and they will also give you pieces of advice to help you, your fellow scientists, you fellow students, you fellow future leaders of the world, changing the world in your field of expertise. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for coming. It's an honor to welcome you to Mendel Museum. It's an honor to welcome you to Sounds of Science 2022. Thank you very much for being here. Good afternoon to you all. For the opening speech, I would like to ask Vice Rector of Masaryk University, Mrs. Sharka Pospishilova. Professor? <laughs> you can see that when he gives a chance, when he's given a chance to talk about science, he's stressless. He can't wait even a moment later. Professor. <laughs> I'm also very much looking forward for your talk, so, so I will speak just very shortly. So it's my really great pleasure uh, that uh, we can be here this Friday afternoon and uh, really welcome to our special guest and welcome to all of you. I, uh, it's uh, really pleasure that we have chance to listen to your talks, to your scientific experiences and uh, listen also your story and your achievements. And I am also very pleased that we are a meeting uh, in this room because this is the room where lived and work another genius scientist, Gregor Johann Mendel, uh, who uh, was born just 200 years ago. And uh, in July, we will celebrate uh, this anniversary. And uh, in this room, our university organized uh, so-called Mendel lectures. And uh, during 20 years, uh, in this place talked already 15 Nobel Prize winners. So I am happy that today this family is growing and uh, uh, I would like to thank really very much to our guests that uh, they decided to come not only to Prague but also to, to our university, Masaryk University and to Brno and uh, I am personally really very much looking forward for your talks and I believe that uh, you provide strong inspiration for our scientists, for our students and for all of us. So thanks for coming and the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. And the floor is yours leads to Veronique Debor Lazaro, the science attache of French Embassy. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm too small. Okay. No, you are the perfect size. We will adjust. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Daniel. Oh, yeah, I will keep it Definitely, really, it's yeah, really short. <laughs> Um, Mrs. Vice Rector, dear professors, dear guests, uh, it's a great pleasure and honor um, to say a few words on behalf of the French Embassy and the Czech Republic here today in this quite unique uh, building. I would like to start by thanking very, very warmly Masaryk University, who's our partner for the organization of this event, uh, for their extraordinary support uh, in the preparation and uh, for giving us access to this uh, quite magical place, a place that's filled with spirituality uh, and also uh, many good scientific vibrations. 
um, I guess one couldn't dream of a better place uh, to celebrate science and the creative force that's behind every great scientist and all the great scientists that we have uh, here with us this afternoon. So when we celebrate science, um, we also celebrate the values that are at the core of the European uh, project, the progress of humankind uh, through intellectual development and the pursuit of, of knowledge. And these are really founding elements uh, of our shared identity. This is what makes us European. And um, this is really important for us to celebrate this this year, uh, this year where both our countries are um, in charge of the presidency of the European Council. So this afternoon, you will be listening to three amazing scientists. Uh, they will take you on a journey from uh, the universe's physical and chemical organization uh, to the role of economic sciences uh, to achieve the general interest. Uh, and right now, I would like to express my utmost and really profound gratitude uh, to those three professors who agreed on joining us in this quite intense adventure between Prague and, uh, Prague and, and Brno. Uh, I would also like to thank again our sponsors and partners because without them that would not have been um, possible. And I will now leave the floor because there are some impatient people in the room. Uh, and I wish you a pleasant and very inspirational conference. Thank you. Chemistry penetrates our life in practical terms even more than any other form of human culture. Says 1987 Nobel Prize laureate in chemistry. He believes that periodic table, the playground of chemists, is the most fantastic product. He described the process that helps molecules identify one another. The father of supramolecular chemistry, the one who will be jumping towards the stage faster than Usain Bolt to the finish line, Jean-Marie Lan. be back here in Brno. It's my fourth time I was here, and the first time was very early on. The city was quite different at that time. So uh, it's nice to be back, and you want this a bit closer? Okay. Yeah. I can do this, but you can also believe yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's especially good to be around. Earlier on, it was to visit universities, and this time is within this, uh, uh, this uh, organization of these prizes, and especially this Sounds of Science, where we try to combine music and science. I would also like to thank Daniel Stack, because he's the best anchorman interviewer, whatever you want, I ever have seen, heard, worked with. So I'm very happy kind. about that. But there's one thing. You talked about imagination. True. But without knowledge, imagination is just a software which has nothing to grind on. And uh, I think there's another word, inspiration, which I think is imagination with a purpose. It's imagination, but having a purpose for doing so. All right. So thank you, and I'm happy to be here. And now I have to see how this thing functions. No, no, ça va, ça va, là, ça va. Ah oui, oui, il faut l'ouvrir. Yes. That's a good point. Yes. It's better to have it, have the PowerPoint. Yes, yes, yes. Here it is. Here it is. Mais il faut le faire en entier. Voilà. That's good, that's good. C'est bien, c'est très bien. So this was this uh, idea of trying to bring together music and uh, science, because Czech Republic is also well known for the musicians, and there's one here which I will mention a bit later. later. So the title of my lecture has to do with uh, Steps Towards Life. That's a big title. It's just to attract people, you know. But we certainly will not go all the way. But I would like to mention that chemistry plays the score. Of course, I use the score for purpose, the special purpose that it has to do with music. Now, for doing that, we have to start very early on. And we will start when the skies were empty and suddenly something happened, a big bang. The big bang was the start of our universe. 
And at that time, our universe was full of energy, vacuum with a lot of energy in it, and you will hear more about that. Uh, there's only physics, no chemistry, no molecules, no living organisms, etc. So that's the age of physics. Then it cooled down, particles formed, atoms formed, atoms connected to make molecules. Then chemistry started around here. This is the age of chemistry. Then these molecules became more and more complicated by different processes which chemists can understand. And uh, they also started to form compartments. And compartments were the first stage of a primitive cell uh, leading to the, uh, the start of a new property of, on our planet, which is life. This is the age of biology. It didn't stop there, on our planet at least, because another property appeared, which is thinking, represented by this very famous statue uh, of Rodin, Auguste Rodin, the thinker. He's thinking very hard, this, this fellow there, as you can see. And so, that is steps towards life and thought, I must say. Now, a short remark, which I usually make, is to say that uh, that's the end of the screen, it's not the end of the evolution of the universe, and we are sitting on a small planet, we will can do nothing about it, the universe is just evolving. But we have understood the universe, which is not so bad. So that's a special power, that is uh, the power of thinking. And of course, music is part of the game, and here is somebody all must, here must recognize. <laughs> you do? Okay. <laughs> Less well known than the ones I showed in Prague, but uh, very unfortunately not enough played. The operas of Janáček are fantastic operas and uh, not enough. I have been serial types here. I never could see an opera of Janáček. That means I was in the wrong time here. But it also means they don't, they don't play it often enough. So, so matter started with divided, or condensed, organized, living, life appeared by mechanisms we will understand someday. Thinking, that's much more complex than just living, and something more, perhaps even more complex than that, which is difficult, to, hard to imagine, because thinking beyond your thinking is something quite problematic. And this is towards complex matter. Now we have to do with, chem with uh, chemistry and music again. And uh, talks always like musique des sphères, music of the spheres. And this, of course, is from Pythagoras to what is now one of the theories of cosmology, string theory, which means that one can continue the analogy by saying that maybe the universe is playing on strings. Just a pun. So the big question which I would like to raise, which I consider, maybe Thomas would not agree with that, but I consider as the most fundamental one, is how does matter become complex? My argument is that general relativity, quantum science, would not exist without the people who did it. So we have to understand how these people appeared. Max Planck, Albert Einstein, without them we wouldn't have the theories and the explanations. So we have to try to understand how they could come about. And mankind, trying to answer this question, has created something which is the one reason why we are here, which is science. And if you look, sorry, if you look at three pillars of science, one is physics, Physics deals with the fundamental laws of the universe. Those who, everything depends on it. This is the basis of everything. Biology deals with the rules of life. These are rules, not laws, because the laws are already given by physics. And chemistry tries and should try to uh, try to understand how you go from very general laws to specific expressions of these laws, like what we have on our planet, and what is on other planets too. Almost certainly life over there too, 
Uh, so uh, how does it, how is it possible that these general laws lead to a specific expression like these organisms with two feet, two hands, ears, and so on, on our planet? My answer to the question is a word which we understand in itself, but we, have, we don't know exactly what to put behind it, how to fill it up, which is by self-organization. I had this morning a discussion with one of uh, the people in uh, the students at the University of Chemical Technology in Prague, and this came up, so I told them, I am convinced that our universe has a basic law which is self-organization. It is driven to organize. And that's uh, maybe a strong statement, but I really think it's the way that our universe works. You can even say that it is a cosmic imperative. This we can discuss also. It gets philosophical, but it's, one can show on very simple cases that organization tries to generate organization and to amplify it. Now, along with science, uh, developing science along the years, along the centuries, came the discovery of the building blocks of our universe. And this is, has now, to make a very long story short, this table is now the table of the building blocks of our universe. I always show it because it's something which is incredible, and I'm always astonished when I see that. When you look at this table, you see the building blocks of our universe. Not just some kind of a table with, with some elements. These are the elements of our universe, these are the elements which make up visible matter in our universe. Incidentally, visible matter is 5% of the total matter. There is 95% of uh, dark energy and dark matter. And this is, I like to call, the matter that matters. We are part of the 5%. And um, it represents the building blocks of the universe. So when you look at it, and there is any other animal, uh, living organism, something on another planet, they are the same. And for the chemist, the carbon-carbon bond is the same everywhere. A carbon-oxygen bond is the same everywhere. Water is the same everywhere. It's sort of incredible. I have a hard time to sort of accept that, but it's inescapable. And this is the sounds of the elements, again, some music. Maybe I should write some songs about elements with one, two, three, four, five, up to 92, which are the natural elements. And the music of chemistry, that's the music chemists play. They write a score using these elements, combining them, and making out of them quartets, symphonies, concertos, and concerti, and so on. Some milestones about building up matter. So chemists try to learn how to build up matter, molecular matter, and we can say two main, that's a bit, it's a bit too close to one another. <laughs> building up urea from uh, its building blocks, this was a sort, it's considered in the history of science a first example of making a molecule from another one. And here it's a molecule which is contained in a living organism, which was produced from a molecule, from an entity, a molecule, not living organisms. And this destroyed this idea of a vital force. At that time of Wöhler, one was still thinking that you could not make anything contained in a living organism, like urea in urine, without the help of this magic force. By showing that, showing you could do it, he destroyed this ma mystical magic force. There is no magic in science. About 150 years later, this much more complicated molecule was made with combined efforts of many researchers working in two laboratories, that of Woodward, pardon, this of uh, Robert Woodward at Harvard, Albert Eschen Moser in Zurich, at the Polytechnic School in Zurich. As you can see, it's much, much more complicated. It took many years, many people, many steps to build it up from its building blocks, C-H-O-N, there's some cobalt, there's, uh, there's a phosphorus, and so on. 
It took many, many years. So this was a sort of the Everest of chemical edification of complex molecules. More complex ones were made since then, but it was considered as a sort of a showing that what molecular chemistry could do. Nowadays, one would probably make it in different ways, more efficiently. New molecules have been made, new materials, new drugs, new properties have been discovered and so on. So molecular chemistry is doing very well and is continuing to do very well. But we then need to ask some questions about what is next. But before we do that, let me point out that chemistry has relationships with music. For instance, Borodin. Borodin you may know by Prince Igor, the opera and symphonies, but Borodin was a chemist. He discovered two reactions, the borodin hunsticker and the aldol concentration, um, the, uh, condensation, uh, Borodin and Wurz. There is always another person with him, because Borodin was the first, but the other one really discovered some of the things which Borodin had done. He considered himself as a chemist, and that music, composing music, was his weekend job, or so to say. Now, this is also something I like to bring about, because you like opera here, I suppose, because of Janacek, and a bit more recent than Janacek is this fellow, Alban, Alban Berg. He wrote his opera Wozzeck on uh, a libretto. He wrote the libretto himself, but he was inspired by Georg Büchner, one of a great German um, poet. And maybe I should add here, I'm sorry, I will take one or two minutes more than that, possibly, I know that. No, Georg Büchner was a fantastic example. Büchner died at 23.5. See? And he is now, the Büchner Prize is the highest literary prize in Germany. And if you have an occasion to read about Georg Büchner, you should. He was very much ahead of his time. The whole family, in fact, was very much ahead of his time. So, now why, why did I show you that? Because in this opera, the doctor is singing. Okay, I have to remain just stay here. So, um, he talks about progress made in sciences, albumin, fats, carbon hydrates, sugars, and even, he thinks, oxyaldehyde anhydride. That is really a chemical word for those who are chemists here. This is the only piece of music I know where there's really a chemical, the real chemical work mentioned. I don't know who introduced it. It must have been Alban Berg because he wrote the libretto also. Okay. Now another comparison of interest. When you build up this huge molecule, vitamin B12, which is here, pardon, which is, which is here at the end, you go through all these steps. All these are the steps to build it up progressively. Ten minutes left, you are joking. <laughs> <laughs> and this is like um, a score of music. And uh, that's a comparison where in music you have many lines, one above the other, and in uh, Richard, this is one of the records, Richard Strauss Salome has 36 different voices which are intermingled and which have been composed and which are played together. Now, what about the next step in chemistry? Here is a cancer cell and two killer cells which are supposed to find the cancer cells in your organism and destroy them when they fight them. Similarly, the blue dots is the HIV virus. When the, the HIV virus hits the white blood cell, it can infect it. How do these entities know that the other is the right partner? So here, the virus wants to infect and the killer cell needs, must destroy the cancer cell. So something must tell these entities, which are formed of molecules at the outside, that what the other one is, what the partner is. And this means that there is a chemistry occurring between molecules in addition to the chemistry inside the molecule, which makes the molecules. 
And this is what we then called a chemistry slice beyond the molecule, which is supramolecular chemistry, which just means that it is the chemistry, <laughs> all right, <laughs> which means it's the chemistry of entities which are bound together by non-covalent intermolecular forces. The three main properties, but I mentioned mostly one, molecular recognition is the way in which molecules recognize one another and life is not possible without this property because in our organism as you're sitting here, all your molecules, they do what they have to do because they recognize each other and then they do at a rate, in a position, in a place and at the moment which is the one required and which is initiated by molecular recognition. The, the, very, the simplest image for representing what molecular recognition really is, is that first of all it needs an interaction, if not the objects ignore each other, but it needs also information for selecting. There is no recognition without information. This is quite obvious. And this was then can be translated into a sort of a complementarity in geometry and interactions. And this picture was given already in 1894 by Emil Fischer, saying that molecules have to fit together like a lock and a key in order to produce a function, an effect. And this was Emil Fischer who proposed that in a very famous paper in 1894. Now, molecular storage of information is extremely important for us because it makes up in the double helix of DNA, it meets up the genetic information which differentiates a living organism from another one, a tomato from an elephant, for instance. And this is stored in this famous double helix, which then is a, a, it's a text which is written with just four letters, as I guess all of, most of you know, just four chemical letters, rather simple chemical letters, which are sitting, which are linked to a strand, a very long string, and this the sequence is the one which determines the, uh, the genetic information and which then can wrap around and make the famous double helix. But this is not enough to store the information, you have to read it. And the reading is simple, a binary system, two points of interaction or three. So it's two, three, two, three, like uh, in a computer electronics, it's 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. The current goes through, the current does not go through. Here is 2, 3, 2, 3, and that's the way in which genetic information is read. And uh, so one may say that the music of genes is just written with four notes. A, G, okay, I replaced T by D because we needed something which looks like D in German. Huh? AGTC, and C for the other note. And you play it just with two fingers, which is very simple. Huh? Just two fingers, but it's enough. And of course, at that stage, I must absolutely mention, come on. Yeah, coming, took time. So, of course, Gregor Mendel, who was a precursor of uh, modern genetics. His ideas were really observations, operational, without any knowledge, of course, what was behind in terms of the chemistry, because the chemistry is really the, the writing of the letters. Now, chemistry is therefore not only what is commonly considered a science of the structure of matter and the transformation of matter, but it is also an information science. It's a science where Matter contains information, the molecules are informed objects, and the, so it's a, uh, the storage of this information is in the molecule itself, and the processing of the information is by contact between molecules, the reading processes. So you can think of building up program chemical systems. In fact, we are, we are a program chemical system because we come from a string of uh, information, which is the DNA. But one can also then try and chemistrite in the... <laughs> chemistrite in their work to also produce in the laboratory systems which can do similar things. 
which is that trying to build molecules which are locks and molecules which are keys, making locks for keys or keys for locks, and this then led to development of the science in many laboratories around the world. Some applications, briefly. The most important, the most evident one is, has to do with locks and keys. Drug discovery, a drug which you take in a pharmacy, is a key for the biological lock. It has to be selective, it has to go to the, to the target, where it should do something, inhibit or accelerate or in amplify. One can develop other things, like for instance this, this uh, label, which is used in medical diagnostics, where you can label molecules and which you can then use for medical diagnostics. Gene transfer also, a transport property where one molecule picks up another one and helps it to go through the membrane to make a genetically modified organism, which is of course some technology which is developing more and more and which is necessary for us, for our survival, for our food, for many reasons. And finally also another interesting development was the development of polymers, that means you would like to call it plastics, which are of supramolecular nature and which were then uh, used, this process this, uh, which we introduced in 1990 was then developed by a small Dutch company, Xeltis, and developed biomaterials based on that and this was used for, the, for correcting, the uh, reconstructing the heart of children who have a severe cardiac malformation. Now, coming back to the main line, which is self-organization, there are plenty, of, we are self-organized, but the, the simplest case is that self-organization of a virus, and the tobacco mosaic virus is one of these program systems where a certain number of building blocks, 2,130, they go together like magic, but it is not magic, they do it because there's information on the surface, the information orients the building blocks, and then they form the virus. And that is spontaneous. It's not something which is magic and you can, we can understand all of these different processes which happen there. It is a sort of a way to let things make themselves rather than to have to make them. It's in sort of the ultimate way to fabricate. Like you can make a, in the future, one can imagine that rather than having to build computers, they will build themselves up by having the right pieces which will recognize one another and just build up the system. This interests uh, for nanoscience and nanotechnology, of course. Now let me just show you a few examples of things which have been made to spontaneously form, build up. For instance, double and artificial double helices and triple helices, shown here. One can make grids where metal ions hold molecules together in a nice grid, which can be addressed in different positions. One can make nanocylinders where long molecules and flat molecules are linked together by these, the, the spheres. These spheres here are um, metal ions, copper, and so on, and a number of others, like for instance those here. But many, many have been made which have demonstrated that one can design uh, um, systems where there is a spontaneous formation, spontaneous but directed, controlled formation of complex architectures. So just one word for what is going to be the next step, which is going on already. I talked to you here about design. You design the objects, you let them go, and they will generate the final entity. But another next step is that you let the system select what it needs from an, a, a collection of bricks using only the ones it needs to build, build itself up. That means it adds a step, a selection step to what was a design step and this then leads to the fact that the constitution of chemical objects becomes, uh, becomes reversible. The object can dissociate, reassociate, reassociate, reassociate. Like when you build a house, you have bricks, if the bricks dissociate, you can build another house with the same bricks. Uh, sort of the analogy. 
And this then leads to the possibility of developing a chemistry which can undergo adaptation, which you may call adaptive chemistry. Because when these objects, chemical objects, dissociate, and if the conditions change in the meantime, it can reassociate, but in a different way. So this is now the development of uh, supermolecular chemistry and the next step beyond it. Let me finish just by stressing some points which are characteristic of chemistry, at least I like to stress them, which is that chemists have, their, have the possibility to create objects of matter by combining atoms differently and making entities which did not exist before they were made. So one can say that the book of chemistry has to be written rather than only read, but of course you have to read it. You have to read what is in a tree, for instance. This exists already. And the score of chemistry has to be composed and not just played. So chemistry has creative power, which can again be represented by a piece of art. There's again Auguste Rodin. That's the hand of the artist, which expresses um, sculpture uh, out of a stone. And the stone is a dead thing, and the stone doesn't contain that. It's the hand of the artist, which uses imagination and inspiration, expresses what is in the stone. And chemistry can do the same with matter, as we know it. And this is the possibility to define chemistry as the art of matter. Almost finished. <laughs> Very close. I would like just to stress that this type of ideas, although of course very differently, people have been thinking a lot about the year, uh, during the years. Somebody who has been very sort of very perceptive of things, uh, be, without thinking the same way as we would do it now, was Leonardo da Vinci. All of you know Leonardo da Vinci, of course. And he wrote this very this fantastic sentence, where nature finishes to produce its own species, trees, flowers, potatoes, tomatoes, and us. Man begins using natural things. Natural things are this periodic table, which has the elements, the bricks of our universe, in harmony with its very nature, with the laws of physics. You cannot, get a, uh, you cannot, cannot go against that. And then comes the ending, which for an artist like Leonardo da Vinci is very strong, to create an infinity of species. But we cannot do that. And um, so this is not the question then of studying just what is natural, as we call it, but also making them ourselves. Now you may say that if we, we are natural, so if we do something, it's natural also, of course. So if man someday in the future modifies, if we modify ourselves, I'm convinced we will do it. In a thousand years, we will not be the same. But it's part of the evolution. The thing, the difference is that now, from the time when Prometheus stole the fire of knowledge from the gods, ah, this thing, he gave it then to mankind. The problem is, and this we have to handle it, that we cannot give it back. So what we know, we know. We cannot just erase it. We have to live with it. But it gives us the possibility of having a control over our destiny. We, as I said, I'm convinced we will not remain the same. And so science will shape our future. So for those who are students here, participate. Finally, sounds of science, combination of music and science. Here is, of course, the name now, but I think all of you recognized this person before. And uh, another aspect of science of great importance is that, first of all, chemistry. If you look at these basic laws of physics, these are the laws of acoustics. But the laws of acoustics, they generate the music, but they don't necessarily contain the music at the start. So chemistry is to science what music is the laws, to the laws of acoustics. And the final aspect, which I'd like to stress, but all those of you who are scientists, they know that, that music and science have no borders. No flags, 
no religion, no cultures, no languages. It's understood everywhere. Music, everybody understands it. Science, everybody. Uh, in fact, it's for everybody the same. I don't say that necessarily one understands it, but it has absolutely no borders. And what is true here is true on a planet, Alpha Centaurus or something like that, in another galaxy. Monsieur, sorry for being a bit late. <laughs> and thank you for your patience. Monsieur <laughs> Marilyn. You know I enjoy listening to you for even much longer than half an hour. Much longer, you know that. I do enjoy that. <laughs> what questions do you have? You can ask anything you want, just raise your hand, we will give you the microphone so we can hear you precisely, and you can ask Jean Marilyn anything you want. Uh, he will do his best to answer the question, am I right? Yeah, that's a promise to be kept. Short, short, short. I will try to be short. Yeah, try to be short. Yeah, the try, that's, that's, the, that's the verb you were, you were stressing out, weren't you? I'll start with the question, with your quote. You said in 2010, 12 years ago, you said, our science is only 200 years old. I cannot imagine what we'll be capable of doing in 1,000 years from now. We will definitely not be the same anymore. Did you figure it out in the last 12 years? What's your tip? What's going to be our science in 200 years like? I have absolutely no idea. Get the mic, please. Get, I will give you the microphone. I will stay next to you. I have absolutely <laughs> no idea how we will be, how we will look. We will have a lot of progress made. For instance, uh, and this is the easiest. People accept much easier, much more easily if it has to do with health mm. and uh, longer time, better life, and, uh, and, uh, and a life uh, worth living. Life quality. So this, yeah. they will, this we will accept much better. But we are all transformed. Huh? Mm. You have maybe implants, you may have lenses in your eyes, huh? you may have some titanium in your hip. And one, what I often say also is, if you get a heart transplant, you cannot say to your wife, your spouse, I give you my heart. <laughs> it's not yours, but it's a pump. So it's a very interesting thing. What are we? I think we are the brain that makes us. The, the rest the is army. pumps and, and uh, mechanics and uh, bones, and they break, but they can repair it. The brain is, if I had to start again, I would be... But no, our chemistry was inspired by neurosystem. But I will not go into that, it's too long. But I would probably go now into neuroscience. At the time I was doing a PhD, neuroscience was in its infancy. And I think understanding how it worked was, of course, many people did it, Severo, Ochoa, and others did so. But uh, I think the ultimate frontier for us. Mm -hmm. But it's the most difficult uh, matter, um, the block oh, of yeah. matter in I the mean, known the, universe. All the sciences have to be, come together mm -hmm. to understand mm -hmm. it. Uh, there's a chemical basis, there's a biological one, there's a physical one. It's, uh, okay, it's, but yeah. you are very lucky <laughs> you have that to do. In, huh? Do you have any questions for Jean Marie? Next generations. We will have a panel debate after all of the free speeches, so you can, you know, save your questions and ask afterwards if there will be something that will come up. The brain, Jean Marie Lan. Thank you very much. No, 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 no. <laughs> That's... Now we will go to a different field. We will go to the field of economics. When he was asked by a reporter of uh, New York Times a couple of years back, what do you do? He started his answer with the words, well, it's complicated. It truly is, but he can make it to look quite simple because his goal is to give simple pieces of advice, a simplifying solutions that will help the society. Economics is a positive discipline. Its goal is to make the world a better place by recommending economic policy measures. He works especially on market power and effective regulations. And he is 2014 Nobel Prize laureate in economics. Jean Terrol. Jean, please.
Well, thank, thank you so much for organizing Sounds of Science in this very, very special environment. Uh, I guess uh, most of you are not economists and you wonder what does an economist do with this time or our time? And it's complicated. <laughs> so if you, want, if you want to know, you can listen to Hyde Park Civilization in a few weeks or months, I don't know. Or we can try to explain a little bit more what we are doing as economists. So, as Daniel said, we try to actually make this world a better place. So, we don't impose our values. We take the values and objectives of the society has given. And then we try to achieve those at the, in the best way. So, we do a little bit. We are not art scientists. We, we are not Jean-Marie. We are not Thomas. But we know we, we, do, we draw theories. We make assumptions. We use logic to have conclusions. We test all of those. And then we try to give policy advice. But the question then is, okay, advice to do what? And that's where the objective function is important. So, rather than take you to some of the things I'm doing, I'm going to uh, actually talk a little bit about this objective function, which we are not the ones to define, but we can help think about. Now, in terms of my career, I've been working uh, on basically antitrust uh, policy and, and regulating big monopolies. That's what the Nobel Prize was about. But economic is very broad. So I've been working on regulation of banks, on microeconomic crisis, on behavioral economics, and, and several things. It's a very broad field. It's a very exciting field because it touches on all kinds of human things. And now it has connected to sociology and psychology, history, political science, and, and much more. So let me, or if I find, uh, no, 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 this is Jean-Marie. Uh, I don't, this was very nice, but this is not really what I want to talk about. So you, could, you can see that Jean-Marie wanted to go on and on and on. <laughs> do, you want to, do you want to take it over and talk about chemistry? Uh, well, Thomas, you want me to, to give your speech? <laughs> Jean-Marie. This is the, the one, That's, I believe. That sounds more like what I'm doing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, the economics of a common good, meritocracy, and social justice. So, I'm not going to take you some, to some antitrust discussion of what we do or how to regulate banks. Or, this is very important. This is you know, the way I work on, but what I work on. But, you know, it's more about the philosophical part and taking the high ground there. So, I'm going to call my special uh, assistant, uh, consultant, Jean-Marie, who I'm sure will tell me how to <laughs> make this. Okay. Um, it's not working properly? I think uh, I'm trying to press the forward button, but... You can move it. Okay, it has moved, actually. It did, yeah, but I used... Oh, you use that. I'm going to use that, don't worry. If you could use the keyboard. And you can use oh, the okay. add the laser as well. Too simple. <laughs> <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Okay. So somehow we all try to you know, promote the common good in some way. And you know, the most obvious observation is, of course, that we ourselves, our corporations, our banks, our, our governments, our countries do not promote the common good in many ways. So, you know, we, we may emit too much carbon, we may refuse to be vaccinated, we may overconsume antibiotics. The businesses and the banks, they may take too much risk, abuse their market power, and you know all of that. And the state, of course, may actually misbehave as well. You know, excessive spending, giving a poor education to the citizens, tolerate too much inequality, create financial crisis by not regulating well enough. And unfortunately, there are lots of examples so where countries misbehave because they pursue the national interests over the interests of the world. So, you know, global warming is an example, the trade wars, fiscal competition, and nowadays, of course, and actually every time in history, military conflicts. So the common feature between all those examples is that the individual interest trumps the general interest, of course. Now, the ambition of the economics for the common good. Um, is, of course, to try to align the interests of citizens, firms, governments, 
and nations with the general interest. And you have two instruments for that. One on which uh, we work a little bit, uh, sociologists actually work much more on that, which is persuasion. Basically try to change a social norm, have, you know, introduce what's called norms-based intervention, encourage good citizen behavior, corporate social responsibility. And that's very useful, but there's a limit to that. And the limit we have seen in the case of global warming, 30 years of exhortation since the Rio summit, and we have done very little. We, citizens, we, corporations, we, governments, we are waiting, we are procrastinating with disastrous consequences. So at some point, and that's a very strong belief of economic, actually not, not, not a belief, it's, it has been well documented, of course, is that we need to put the general interest in the center, back in the center, through incentives. Try to change the incentives. Now, to do what? To do what? Well, what is a goal in society? We all have different positions in society. We have different countries, different experiences, different social classes, different fields, whatever. And, you know, some old tradition of the 17th, 18th century, also lots of thinkers of the 20th century, talk about the veil of ignorance. The veil of ignorance is basically a simple question. Complicated to answer, but a very simple question. Imagine that you are not born yet. So you don't know whether you'll be a man or a woman, whether you'll have the right genes or the wrong genes. Maybe you'll get a cancer early on, or maybe you'll be in good health. Well, whether your parents will be educated or not, whether you live in a rich neighborhood with good schools or a poor neighborhood, what your religious aspiration, uh, whether you'll be religious in the first place, whether you know, what your sexual preferences will be, your political preferences will be, and so on. And you ask yourself, okay, I don't know who I'm going to be. And in what kind of society would I like to live in? And this is a very, very simple question, and it's, it's a very fundamental question. And from that, you already get a lot of conclusions, very simple conclusions. So all kinds of insurance policies against the mishaps of life. So, for example, you may not have the right genes, you may get sick and have handicaps and the like. And of course, you like to get insured against that behind the veil of ignorance, because you don't know you might be in this situation. Uh, redistribution, if we have too much inequality, you want to redistribute some of the income and wealth. Access to education, you are insured, you must be insured against, sorry to say that, against the family you are born in or, or the neighborhood you are going to grow up you know, in and so on. Um, you have to fight against gender and race-based inequality and the like. You want some prosperity, of course, and the state is also there to supply the infrastructure, regulatory infrastructure and, uh, and basic infrastructure to reach prosperity. prosperity. Uh, correct externalities and internalities. You know, if people pollute too much and it's very damaging for the planet, well, we have to, uh, it's a duty of the state actually to correct that. There's no m reason why the market will do that. So you need to have state intervention to avoid that. Internality, so you probably never have heard the word internalities. Internality is an externality on yourself. It's basically when you hurt yourself. In general, you do that because you are too impatient, you're impulsive. So, you know, I may, I may take drugs, I may smoke too much. I may undersave, I may watch too much TV instead of uh, learning physics and chemistry. Um, that's an internality. I play, you know, in favor of my current self against my future selves. And I privilege, I, I put too much, uh, too much weight on the presence. And we want societal regulation, we want tolerance with people who have different views on religion, ethnicity, politics and sexuality and so on. Okay, that's, that's simple. Uh, it doesn't give you all the answers. I mean, even if you succeed in running this uh, sort of experiment, there are still value judgments. The value judgments on, for example, you know, what is the in-group in a sense? You know, how do you define your group? Are those the, the students in, in Brno? Are those you know, citizens of the city? Also, Czech citizens, European citizens, world citizens. Um, that's very important because lots of policies have to do with, say, you know, globalization. Often, you know, it, it, 
you confront some European worker against some uh, Chinese worker, for example. So what, what is your group? How do you define your group? And similarly, you can do that temporally. So, you know, the choice between, you know, the current generations versus the future generations. Um, in terms of inequality, if you do things well, there's a trade-off between growth and prosperity and equality. Where do you draw the line? And you know, I don't have an answer to that. It's, it's more personal. And finally, the normative and positive analysis may not be the same. So imagine that you're in favor of a lot of redistribution, and I will come back to the kind of reasoning that might bring you to that point of view. You still have to ask yourself, well, that's in an ideal world, but now my talents may move abroad. And we know that in academia, lots of them go to the US and, and, and the UK and Switzerland because salaries are better, the research conditions are better. Um, same thing with doctors, with start and so on. And then what do you do? You want more redistribution, but that, that goes against keeping your talents. And, you know, that's a complex issue. Same thing with carbon. You know, you want to reduce your carbon in prints and you start taxing your firms and then the production moves abroad where it's not taxed. So what do you do? That's very important. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about meritocracy. Why? Because it's an interesting topic. It sounds like an obvious thing. We want a world which is meritocratic. But that is, that is being disputed. So just uh, in the last few years, there's been a lot of discussion about that. So meritocracy, or at least meritocracy lights, that's my own terminology, is about rewarding talent and effort, not luck and privilege. I'm sure you will agree with that point of view. And therefore, the resources, the jobs, and so on should be allocated on the basis of competition as opposed to patronage, nepotism, birthright, and the like. And meritocracy gives you a double dividend. The first dividend I will come back to is prosperity, because you reward effort as long as those efforts are productive. There is social demand for the output. But also you promote, promote justice. You know, it's not because you are born in such a category of, of citizen that you'll be, uh, you'll be having the top jobs. It has a long intellectual tradition, which goes back to the Greeks, of course. If you, there's a recent book by Adrian Woolrich that you may want to read about the history of uh, this thing. But of course, it has been applied recently in Europe, uh, you know, 19th, 20th century. But you know, if you think about China in the 7th century, it mainly started in the 10th century, it has been very big because you know, it started selecting people, the top civil servants, on the basis of meritocracy. The prosperity case for meritocracy is pretty clear. You don't waste talents. The next Marie Curie is going to go to a good school and is going to have education and will become Marie Curie, or the next Marie Curie. Um, more generally, you know, it's not because you have the wrong gender, the wrong race, or the wrong ethnicity that you cannot actually achieve what you can achieve if you have a meritocratic state. Then you, once you have that, you provide incentives for hard work because you reduce the influence of connections, birthright, and so on in rewards. You reward effort and not luck. And finally, you match position with those who are most able to occupy them. So your brain surgeon will be really the right brain surgeon, which is reassuring to some extent. Okay. Now, recently there has been charges, attacks against meritocracy from both the radical left and the radical right, the conservative populist. And both of them incriminate out of touch, empathy lacking, self writers and elitist meritocrats. And of course, they distrust and denigrate the experts taking part in the public debate. By the way, a very interesting fact is that the populists don't like facts. And because facts are where scientists and experts uh, are comfortable with, but they of course contradict much of what the populists talk about, and the populists don't like you know, experts. And you know, there are lots of interesting citations concerning that. Maybe more interesting, let's leave aside those radical left and radical right. Maybe more interesting are some prominent intellectuals who have written books against meritocracy. 
So there was a pioneer called uh, Michael Young in the, in the 50s, but more recently, two very famous intellectuals actually took a stand against meritocracy. One is Daniel Markovich, who is a professor of law at Yale University, and the other one is a star professor at, at Harvard, uh, Michael Sandel. And you see the title, The Meritocracy Trap, The Tyranny of Merit. Okay? Now, let me explain their point of view. And some of it is interesting, some of it I disagree strongly with. But uh, let me try to explain their point of view. The first point is that meritocracy has a long way to come true. Um, meritocracy, we know, requires an equality of chances. And in many countries, certainly in, in the US and in France, they write mainly about the US because they are based in the US, the equality of chances is grossly violated for different reasons, depending on the countries. It's not the same for the US and France, by the way. Money plays a much bigger role in the US. But, you know, by and large, the equality of chances is grossly violated. Um, the poster child of meritocracy is educational equality. Of course, there are other things having to do with race, gender, beauty, whatnot, whatnot. But educational equality is very important for several things. First, the labor market, that's kind of obvious. Uh, social status, and that's one of their points, actually, that in a meritocracy, social status is highly correlated with your labor market outcome. Because in a sense, you know, if everybody has the same chance, then you may start comparing people and your status is actually highly correlated with your income. But finally, something which is not well known, less well known, is assortative mating. Assortative mating is really the fact that highly educated people marry with highly, edu highly educated people. That has always been the case, but as has been growing in the last 30 or 40 years, and I'll be happy to, disc to offer some, some conjecture about why it's the case. But it has a very, very big impact on inequality. First, of course, you have to two highly successful individuals who marry together. And you know, that, that means that you increase inequality. But also, that translates at the children level, because parents invest more and more in education. We know that parents are crucial in a way for the education of their parents, especially in the crucial age of zero to six year old. And, and of course, that contributes this endogamy in, uh, in mating contributes a lot to children inequality as well as parent inequality. Now, this first point of, uh, of Markovich and Sandel is kind of strange if you think of it. I'm sure you have had this reaction, which is that it's really a nod to meritocracy. What they are saying is that it's not that we have too little meritocracy, you know, we have too little, <laughs> we actually need more meritocracy, we need more, okay? So that's a weird argument. Now, a deeper argument, and some, something I don't have an answer to, but I have some conjectures. You know, in principle, you like to reward effort, but not reward luck. Okay, that sounds reasonable, right? Uh, because you want to reward effort to provide incentive, actually, to, to create wealth to, 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 for our society. So, simplifying, the performance of someone, you know, whether you succeed or fail in your job, for example, depends on your effort, effort at school, effort at work. At the other end of the spectrum, there is pure luck or bad fortune. So you, you are born with a birth handicap, you are barred from school because of your race, or you are discriminated against. Okay, that's kind of obvious. This is luck or bad fortune. But in between, it's complicated. And let me mention the talent. Some people believe that talent should be rewarded. Some people don't believe. Actually, one of the main philosophers of the 20th century, John Rawls, actually disagreed. He said talent should not be rewarded. And his reasoning is that talent is actually a lot of luck. Okay? So the idea is that you know, your genes, you didn't, didn't contribute to the making of your genes. Uh, maternal stress, you were not even born. The family you are born in, the soft skills you acquire when you are young, the environment you are in, your neighborhood, your school, neighborhood schools, your teachers, you don't do much to deserve that or, you know, this is a lot of luck. But not only, of course, because some 
of your talent is also the investment of your parents, for example, in your talent. So you see talent is a lot of luck, but it's also some effort, embedded effort. And of course, you know, live in a community. So, you know, you, you can be Mbappe or Lionel Messi, but if you don't have a supporting cast behind you, you won't be a good soccer player. Forget about it. And same thing for a researcher, you know. We all testify that we exist uh, just because we have extremely good uh, colleagues and students. Without that, we would not be where we, where we are. Um, same thing in, in corporations, you need, you, you need to have uh, people around you. So the key question is, we all agree that you have to reward effort, but not luck, but you know, what is luck and what is effort? And actually, even if you take a broad view of meritocracy by saying your know, talent is just luck, um, you, you know, it may go too far or not far enough. So I already mentioned that nurture itself involves parental effort and therefore you have embedded effort in talent. But you may also say it doesn't go far enough. Even effort and choice are subject to question. So your effort depends on your self-discipline. You're working at night, you could be watching TV. But of course, self-discipline is also something that you acquire when you are young, in your family environment, partly. Um, and also, we know that choice, I mean, you know, economists now work a lot in, in psychology and other fields, but, you know, some of the choices uh, is uh, hampered by behavioral feature like addiction and so on. So it's, it's actually much more complicated than that. So I'm not giving you an answer, but I'm just saying, when you want to think in what kind of society we want to live in and you know, what kind of policy we should be doing, for example, with respect to the redistribution is actually quite complicated. The third argument is a meritocratic treadmill, what's called the rat race. So the point of Markovich and Sandel is that meritocracy creates very intense competition for goods, both jobs and prestige. If you get the job, you also get the prestige. And it's a race race where everybody loses. And that's a strange argument in their work. The idea is, of course, the losers, they suffer a double whammy. They get an unrewarding job and also they get a social stigma. But what about the winners? You might say they are quite happy, but you know, the idea is that they exhaust themselves. They work extremely hard, very young at school, and then they keep on working hard their whole life and they actually don't enjoy life. So, well, and first, I have a hard time actually uh, feel so, feeling sorry for the winners, to be honest. But um, if you think a little bit more like an economist and you ask yourself, is there a rat race? A rat race in, for an economist is that there is too much investment somehow, too much investment in human capital in this case. So, in a you know, standard result in economics is that if you have a competitive labor market with a sort of matching between employee and employers, um, then the outcome of this competitive market is that differences in wages reflect exactly the difference in marginal productivity. So basically, you as an employee, you get the extra productivity you, you bring compared to another one to your firms. Um, and there are two externalities in a sense, and they're completely offset each other. There's a rat race, we compete to get the good jobs, but at the same time, in this competition, we bring higher productivity to the firm, and they're too, offset, they're too offset. So the educational investment, according to this very simple-minded uh, theory, are socially efficient. There's no rat race. So let me complicate the story a little bit. Now, let's assume that you have a government who for good reasons want to reduce, redistribute inco income from the rich to the poor, at least to some extent with some tax rate. It's the case in every country with very different, of course, tax rates. And then you find that the agents do not internalize their contribution to the public goods which are financed through their taxes. Because when you, when you succeed, you, you of course create more productivity and then you end up uh, paying more taxes and those taxes can be used to finance schools and and finance public goods, uh, hospitals and the like. So now you have the conclusion there is not enough rat race, we don't work hard enough because we don't internalize you know, the impact of our taxes on, on the public goods. 
It's more complicated than that because now if you add prestige, and I'm not going to do the entire slide, but if you add prestige, that's the reverse now. Because prestige is very different from productivity. Productivity, you create wealth. You create wealth for your firm. You create wealth for society through your taxes. Prestige is what economists call a zero-sum game. Or what sociologists call a positional game. So when I buy prestige, it's at your detriment. Because it's a relative ranking. Okay? So you know, it's a rat race. There is a real rat race for prestige. And in the end, the conclusion is not that simple. Fourth point, and I'm, I'm going to come back to the same point, they argue, you know, Sandel and, uh, and Markovic argue, that meritocracy creates animosity. It destroys social cohesion due to the hubris of, uh, of winners. So the winners are arrogant. I mean, if you listen to Jean-Marie and, and Thomas, they are not. But there are, it's true that there are some winners who are very arrogant. Um, so the hubris of winners may be unwarranted. It comes back to the previous discussion. What is luck and what is effort, in a sense? But saying that meritocracy increases the hubris of winners, I'm not sure that's true. If you go back, if you went back to the old caste system or the nobility system, those were very arrogant people. You know, the winners of that are extremely arrogant and despise the lower down, the ones who are lower down. And something that we economists and, of course, sociologists worked a lot on is the aspiration for distinction. You know, this particular rat race, which we are always searching for prestige. It could be the birth status, but if you go back to any court, like the court of Louis XIV, you know, the prestige was won through the etiquette, so you cultivated manners, wit, very, very mean, very derogative, usually you, you made fun of others in a very funny way. Uh, you were playing with, with words, you will, you know, defend your honor with duels. Um, nowadays, you also search for prestige through conspicuous consumptions. If you go back to Bourdieu, um, you know, the, the hyper class is dominating also in terms of taste. You, you try to separate yourself from the chaff, you know, through your taste for food, your, your taste for music, your taste for art. And I will add nowadays to Bourdieu, your taste for exercise, which is very class dependent for smoking or not smoking, for diversity, pluralism, international networks and the like. But Something I, I want to, it's a walk a mole game. So, yeah, so if you try to, to press a mole there, it's going to appear somewhere else. And the walk a mole game exists because if you look at the so called egalitarian societies, I mean, you have lived until 1919 an egalitarian society, right? But it turns out it's not egalitarian at all, and there is a big search for prestige. So there was a um, fierce, fierce competition for status. You know, the Soviet Union was a particular case of that. Um, but even within the scientific community, which, by the way, is a wonderful community. Uh, yeah, I wake up every morning happy that I'm going to my lab and so on. But don't be mistaken. There is a high search for prestige. You know, people want to be the star professor. They want to be the star researchers. They want to be the public intellectual and so on. So don't be mistaken. There is always a search for prestige. Um, and finally, the last point, and I'm going to stop there, I guess. I don't know. I can see how many slides I have. Maybe 20. Um, the idea is that the meritocracy uh, legitimizes low tax rate. In a sense, you may understand why. Because in a meritocracy, effort becomes more important. So people are have a temptation to do more effort and you have to, you can try to incentivize to do even more. So the prediction in the theoretical prediction is that, you know, the, and actually this is, this actually fits well with the data, is that in a more meritocracy, meritocratic society, you, you want to increase uh, taxes, everything else being equal. And, and that goes back to what kind of beliefs we have about what determines success. Is that luck or is it effort? Sociologists like Lerner have 
worked on the belief in just world and the very different perception of the ratio of the two in the US and in Europe. Actually, with Roland Benabou, I've worked on that as well uh, about 15 years ago. Many economists are working on that, and that goes back to motivated attribution, like concepts in psychology. And maybe one more, because Daniel is so nice. He's not going to grab me, and he's, he's, he's a little bit annoyed because you know, taking so much time. But, uh, I don't know why you blame me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, but now, you know, in economics, is this concept of the soft budget constraint. So when you exceed your budget, you know, the principle is going to help you get more. And you know, I've learned with Jean-Marie that actually you can push a little bit the soft budget yeah, constraint. Yeah, it has negative Daniel. consequences. I'm familiar with the theory. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you, <laughs> you fit perfectly well. So, just to conclude, that will be my last slide for sure. For conclusion, the merit crisis flaws are easy to point out, but not easy to perfect. So we understand meritocracy, like democracy, doesn't work well, but it's the best we have. Um, and actually, if you read those two books, which are really uh, very interesting and also a very, very successful book in the market for books, um, you are very disappointed at the end by the recommendation because those are recommendations, most of them you already knew, kind of social democrat recommendations, uh, you know, give a good education to everyone. And it's kind of obvious. Maybe you tax labor a little bit less. Labor has been taxed a lot uh, lately for, for economic reasons I can discuss. Uh, regulate more, blah, blah, blah. I mean, nothing really new. And they have a few exotic recommendations like make education less competitive, less time consuming, no work at home, which, by the way, I think is completely wrong because that's the best way to handicap the the classes which are disadvantaged, you increase inequalities this way, you expand enrollment um, at elite school, uh, Sandal even proposes a lottery of the qualified for the students entering Harvard, so you take, instead of taking 2,000, you take 40,000 and then you, you draw a lottery. This is, I, I couldn't explain to you, I, I just think it's wrong. Um, this is not reasonable. Um, but definitely we can, of course, implement social democrat precepts, possibly differently. So if you take affirmative action, for example, I just think it's wrong to take disadvantaged students and just put them in a university where they will sink or swim. This is not a social policy. You take students who are not prepared and you say, oh, we did well, you know, we, we admitted those disadvantaged students in our school. This is not right because they are going to sink. And what you have to do is really, and we do that on a very small scale at the Toulouse School of Economics, we try to take pupils from high school or from disadvantaged background, only a few ones because we have a small budget and we, we try to give them one year to prepare to enter the school so they don't sink, they will swim. Uh, that's very important. And, and you know, we need, we need to, to do various things. Uh, and in the end, we also need to have some non-based intervention, both at school and in life. So that the winners, actually, they understand that, sure, they deserve it, sure, they have worked hard, they have seized the opportunities, and that's very important, we should encourage them to do that, but they also have benefited a lot from luck. So let me conclude with that, and, and thank you very much. In the book Economics for the Common Good, you can learn more of uh, Jean Terrault's work, uh, more perspectives, and uh, these perspectives dis discussed in much more greater detail. You can find it online uh, and uh, check it out. Do you have any questions? Or better, better you ask, what kinds of questions do you have? We will give you the microphone so we can hear you properly. If I may ask you, please, thank you very much indeed. We'll give you the microphone and please ask your question. Well, I have one quite simple question. Who is supposed to decide what's the common good? Well, as I said, I mean, it's not up to the economists to decide what is a common good, because what we do, we are like engineers. We try to say, oh, you want this goal, and then here is the best way to achieve it, or the best way we know, because we also have imperfect knowledge. Uh, but we are not in charge of defining the goals of society. 
our values as economists are not better than the values of society. I mean, we cannot pretend that. But what we can do is to help, just like philosophers in a sense, we can help uh, people think about what they want to achieve as well and you know, try to this debate. So for example, this debate on meritocracy, which actually now is bridging all social sciences. You know, Markovich is a lawyer, Sandel is a philosopher, and economists are interested in that and many others as well. So we, we can this, you know, help people think about a process to define what, what the values are. Because the difficulty really is that we all have different positions in society. We all have different paths. We all have different tastes. And it's very hard to agree on something. The veil of ignorance is not perfect, as I explained, but at least it forces you to say, well, I could be any of you, and any of you could be me. And you know, I'm not born yet. I'll, I want something, a kind of society, society I would like to live in. It's pretty difficult to, to do, actually, as an exercise, because we are so influenced by our current being that actually it's very hard, actually, to, to perform this exercise. So the, your, the answer to your question, it's not up to the economists to decide what society should be doing. We have to build a toolbox. That's what, that's what we can do. And it's up to the society via elections to decide what the common good is? So the question is, who in society is going to decide what the common good is? Well, we have elections for that, and unfortunately, they don't always work well. It's, you know, I was mentioning meritocracy, but democracy, of course, is a, is a difficult concept. And, and nowadays, with all those populist movements, we, we see how bad a democracy can get. But you know, as, as the adage says, you know, that the best we have so far, we, we haven't worked out a better system. We, we do advise uh, on, on different systems for technical decisions. For example, we economists, and not, not everybody agree, agree with that, but uh, for technical decisions, more than for societal decisions, we, we like to have actually independent agencies to take those decisions because they are more insulated from lobbying and, and capture by interest groups. Um, that's how we tame the inflation until recently, how we tame inflation in central banks, how we get competition policies which are going to help us fight the GAFAs. In the old time, you know, the firm will call the minister and say, you solve that for me, because the minister was in charge. And of course, the minister will say, yes, don't worry. Um, <laughs> nowadays, it's much more complicated. You, you really have to make an economic argument that you are not abusing your power. So independent agencies have their benefits, and I would I want to affirm, but they're only as good as their executives are. Mm -hmm. And that raises the issue, you know, you have a non-elected person who is not accountable, and you give power to that person. That has worked well, but that doesn't always work mm -hmm. well. Jean Terrell, thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. It's impossible, said the scientific community. He made the impossible possible, and he explained why. Just the explanation took him nine years, but he made it. He explained why can light pass through openings that were believed to be much too small for it. And that's why he received 2014 Kavli Prize in nanoscience. He's working in the world when, when you say its diameter is one millionth of a meter, you are talking about something that is really big. He's the man who is nowadays physical chemist, who hated chemistry in high school. <laughs> After high school, he took a break to work on a chemical tanker. When he received his first watch, he took it apart to figure out how it works. And now he's the one who curse about alchemy in a special world. Ladies and gentlemen, Thomas Ebersen. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. So I will put this up. Where's the key? Oh, here it is. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I'll do this. It'll be much freer. <laughs> so I've been waiting to do this. <laughs> and I have my own laser pointer. Two important things for a scientist giving talks. Anyway, so it's nice to be here. I've never been to Brno first. It's the second time in Czech Republic. And um, as you can hear, I have a loud voice. 
So I don't know if I need even the microphone. So I'm going to, indeed, we heard about the veil of ignorance. Well, I come from ignorance, and that's an asset. It can be an asset. So play a little bit on what we just heard, which was very interesting, by the way. And, and, uh, and uh, there's something about having knowledge, too much knowledge, which can block you in your openness to new things. So I come from, I was a kind of a bad student, and, and that allowed me to be perhaps freer in my thinking. And so I'm going to tell you about a little bit of what I've been doing for the last uh, 10, 15 years, and which is about something that is all around us, ties into the universe. We heard about the physics in Jean Maillen's talk, that the universe started with the Big Bang, and then it evolved. And actually, it turns out that most of the chemistry and the biology is linked to the existence of a lot of things in the universe that we can't see, that are present in this room, in your brain, in your eyes, everywhere. You can't escape it. There's a background of fluctuations in the universe, like background noise, that actually define the properties of matter as we know it. And if we turn those things off, actually matter wouldn't exist as we know it. So it's not just like, oh, you know, we can live without that kind of a thing. No, it's a fundamental thing of nature. And, uh, and to understand this, I have to explain to you what nothing is how nothing is, is vacuum, is space, three-dimensional space. And to do that, I have to sort of go back. And this relates light and matter. So there are three things that are coming to my talk, light and matter, and nothingness, the space in which we exist. And so let me go back and talk about light, light-matter interactions. So we all know that light plays a critical role in society. Your internet wouldn't work without, oh sorry, you can see, okay, so I'll go further back, you'll still hear me. So, uh, you know, I couldn't see you without light matter interactions, you wouldn't be able to send emails to the other side of the world without light, your telephone sending an a, 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 a electromagnetic wave for your Wi-Fi to a system, which then turns into an electronic signal, which then gets sent through fibers across the world under the sea. The rate of growth of fibers on the sea is faster than the speed of sound. That's how fast the growth on the network is. Of course, it costs a huge amount of energy. So, that's light matter interactions in many things, in vision. So, light goes into your eye, it switches a, a molecule, retinal, and this little H new is, for those of you who don't know it, a photon. So, light comes in forms of particles called photons. And uh, they play a crucial role. Now, light matter interactions also play a role in the biosphere. We wouldn't be here, at least the life as we know it wouldn't be like that, if without uh, plants having evolved to capture light, or organisms have captured light, the energy of light, and turning it into something useful. I like to show this picture because it's from Norway, where I was born, and there, believe me, you're very happy with some light in the winter time to deal with this kind of weather. Huh? And, the, and light matter interactions allows you to capture and then store the light, and it's a complex process that I cannot go into, but it involves, the first process involves going between states. And so I need to explain to you, to be able to do the rest, to explain how light is captured. So as you know, you've heard about quantum mechanics, I'm sure. You think, what the hell is that? It's okay, you don't need to understand it, all the details, all you need to know is that everything comes in steps, in, in levels, floors, and so forth. So even the matter, the reason your, your dresses have different colors is because there are energy levels in these molecules here that are in different solutions that have different gaps, there are steps. These steps means quantified, and because it's quantified, that's where the word quantification comes from, quantum mechanics. It's just that there are any, every, all the energy levels in matter are come in discrete levels. And depending on the spacing between these two levels, so this is how a chemist represents an energy level, a straight line and these little sub-levels here are little vibrations that jiggle the system at the same time. And so when you go, the spacing between these energy levels here is higher here than in this. In the blue, this distance is higher than in the red. So when a photon comes in, hits this solution, it, it, if it matches this, this energy, it gets absorbed. 
And then it the molecule has so much energy that it, you can use this to change matter. That's what happens in the eye. And, and which you can use also to construct new molecules, even though you could also do it by heating. And, and that's where vision and photosynthesis come in, and you can also have it emit, and that's what you see in a discotheque, for example. This is uh, um, uh, Schweppes, tonic Schweppes. It's uh, a molecule which is put in against malaria, and which is there, and that gives this bikinin, which gives this beautiful fluor blue fluorescence. So the, what's more surprising, and this is what I want to bring you to, and this is what we've been working on for the last 15 years, is that light matter interactions even occurs in a droplet like this in the dark. So what kind of light matter actually occurs in the dark? You might ask, and I, indeed that's very not so easy to understand, and that's what I'm going to try to explain to you. And this sort of, why is this important? Because this relates to the fact that this background that's in the universe that influences uh, what, how matter is. So, to do that, I have to explain to you what is vacuum or what space, what is in space-time in the universe in which we exist. So, then you can go back in history and then you have to sort of help, uh, that it's perhaps easier to understand, that people have been discussing for thousands of years what is, is there such thing as a vacuum, meaning a void between matter. Is matter continuous, like Aristotle thought, or like Democritus, uh, Democritus thought, no, 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 they're atoms, and indeed he was right. And there were, to, for things to mix, so for example, how the sugar dissolves in water, or how, uh, 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 I don't know, wine gets diluted and changes color in, a, in some water, not a good idea, but it's an experiment one can do. The, 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 how does these things mix? They can only mix if there's space between the atoms. In the old days, they thought atoms were, were like molecules. And indeed, but despite the fact that this was the most logical, Aristotle views was, was the one that survived and lived into the Middle Ages. And it's only in the 17th century that things started to change. 17th century is the beginning of modern science. Okay, the kind of things that we are, basis on which we built everything we have seen or heard today. And, in, uh, and at that time, they used vacuum pumps. And people think, you know, like a bit like a, a pump that you use for, for uh, putting pressure on a, on a bicycle, but the reverse of that, so you suck air out of a system. So pumps have existed for a long time. And three people are well known in Italian, a German and a French. And, uh, and um, the German scientist did an experiment which is commemorated by this this uh, uh, this uh, print from 16, 1654. So he took these two half spheres of metal here, shown here, and he stuck them together with a liner. All this is explained. And then he sucked the vacuum, he pulled the air out of this into this sphere, and the two half spheres got stuck because of the pressure of all the air of the atmosphere pushes down. And then he, nobody could separate them. And he'd go around, like here, I'd go around, show it to you, and you'd try to pull it apart, and you wouldn't. Then I'd just open a little valve, let the air in, and I would magically be able to separate the two things and disimpress people. Obviously, because they didn't understand what pressure was. So uh, this was then, he had to repeat this in front of a prince, and here the prince standing there with a little cane and uh, in Germany, and there are eight horses on so both sides, and still they couldn't pull it apart, and he did it. So this, I call this the Instagram from 1654, okay? <laughs> so, commemorating this event. So, but Huygens, uh, who gave us things like interference and uh, clocks, I'll come back to that later on, and Newton, uh, were most perturbed by the experiments of Pascal and Torricelli, because they did experiments in glassware. They had glass tubes because they distilled alcohol. Okay, so original chemical equipment sort of comes from good wine. And, and what, why, why were they perturbed? Because they could see light going through the glass to empty what they thought was nothing, where there was nothing. And they saw light propagate through the glass, they could see through their eyes, and they thought that would be impossible because they thought light was carried by gases, just like waves on the surface of a water. And so they thought, well, if they doesn't, if they, if, if you've taken out all the matter, of course, which they hadn't done, but that's not that's incidental. 
then there must be something left. And something left is when you don't know what it is, you call it, give it some name. And so in those days, they called ether. You know, x-rays comes from the fact that they didn't know what it was, so they called it x-rays. Dark, today we have the same thing with dark matter, dark energy. It just means we don't, we are in the dark. N human, human and scientists are in the dark. So this is a, ether was given this name to something that re remains after the vacuum is pulled. And this survived all of Maxwell's equations and everything in the 19th century, where we finally got the theory to explain the behavior of traditional, classical explanation of light. And surprisingly, and then in the beginning of the 19th century, Einstein came around with special relativity and general relativity, and he showed that actually there was, there was no need for an ether. Light just traveled in three-dimensional space and light followed the curvature of this space, which were deformed by gravity. And this was actually measured to the great impression of people. I mean, this had a huge impact at the time in the newspapers. And, and then there was no more ether. Vacuum suddenly was the void and vacuum was now just three-dimensional space. Don't make the distinction anymore. And this notion that there was nothing that nothingness was just X, Y, Z and a mathematical graph just lasted less than 20 years. Why? Because quantum mechanics had appeared, people had understood that there were energy levels in materials and tried to rationalize that, and that's how quantum mechanics appeared. And then people started asking themselves, but how do things interact at a distance? You know, you have probably all done little experiments with magnets in school, where you have little powder and, and you see the powder, the lines line up between the magnets. Okay, why are those lines there? Huh? Why are they there? Did any physics teacher or chemistry teacher teach you that? No, they didn't. They just say they were field lines, but what the hell are field lines? How does a positive charge recognize a negative charge? What is positive and negative, actually? It means absolutely nothing when you think about it. It's just a mathematical convention. So how does a positive charge recognize you're negative and you're positive? How can they do that? If you are some of you are teachers here, think about that. How are you going to teach this to your students if they ask you that question? Which actually, I did ask my physics teacher and got a very bad grade because he didn't have the answer. This is a true story on top of it uh, for you, Daniel. So, so, because uh, he knows so much about my life, it's embarrassing. He knows things that I don't know about myself anymore. Anyway, so then they start asking that, and the man who did the theory for this, start nucleated the theory for this, was a man, a British man called Dirac. Great scientist, and he developed a theory which is the successor to quantum mechanics. So you think, oh, you worry about quantum mechanics. No, you don't have to worry about quantum mechanics. You can now say the real theory is quantum electrodynamics. That comes after quantum mechanics. And that's the most successful theory to date that explains just about everything in this universe. And quantum, that was the beginning. Of course, it wasn't called that when he found it, but he predicted things like the existence of antiparticles, and then people found them. In, in, in bubble chambers and so forth, and then they were, he got the Nobel Prize because that was just amazing that there were such things as antiparticles. And out of this theory, the, it became clear that suddenly we have an explanation for why the magnets attract each other, why those lines were there, why a positive charge could see a negative charge. And actually, I'm not going to talk about all the things that are in vacuum because they're actually particles coming in and out of existence right here. They come in, go out, come in, go out, and they leave no trace except on matter. But you cannot see them. We, can, we don't need to see them. That's why we don't have any tools to see them. But it explains how uh, things behave. So I will just talk about one thing. One type of, there are four types of fields in, in space, in the universe, everywhere in the universe. And I'm going to only talk the one that drives electrical and magnetic forces. And that is driven by photons. So photons, light particles, are actually momentarily created, and they're also known as they're virtual photons because they don't stay, they're ephemeral, and they generate the forces between magnets, between a magnet and a fridge. And this is what I like to uh, talk about, I'm going to tell more about in a minute, in a second. So when light is emitted from a a light source like this lamp, you learn in school something that's just partially correct. 
It just flies directly in a, a geometrical optic, as it's called, and you have these images of lensing and going into your eye, and that's really only part of the story. That sort of describes the consequences of everything. The reality is, photons grows from the lamp into a state in space, and then it goes from that state in space into your eye. And because there are these states for light in space, they are quantum states, and now we can, sorry, I have to come back to quantum. They are these states in space, and because you might have heard of something called Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, or some thing that you can talk about if you have nothing else to do, they, this tells you that quantum states' energy are ill-defined. That's why you cannot cool things to absolute zero, because things still jiggle. There's still some residual energy in the system. And all these optical states have residual energy energy. And one way to call this is here, because we're talking about electron light, they are called electromagnetic fluctuations. So they fluctuate. And so the whole universe is full of these fluctuations. Another way to describe it is that momentarily they generate beginning of a photon and they disappear. Beginning of a photon and they disappear. So you cannot see them, but they're there, everywhere, right here in this room. So, here is an image of this, calculated by a theoretician, of vacuum fluctuations. So, you see these plus and negative, plus and positive and negative versions of this. Two different colors represent sort of plus minus. The plus minus cancel out. But you actually, you can do measurements today to measure these things, these fluctuations. And then I come back to this light, uh, the, what, that photons are exchanged. So, a positive charge recognizes a negative charge, or another positive charge at distance, by exchanging photons with it, these virtual photons, these fluctuations that you see here. These rather bizarre photons, but nevertheless are photons. And so, this is also how a magnet sticks to a fridge. And as I said uh, yesterday, was it yesterday only? In, in, in Prague, this is the kind of thing you want, you want, if you have nothing to talk about over a beer in a bar and you want to be very, sound very nerdy, you to explain to people that actually a magnet sticks to a fridge because it's exchanging photons with the fridge. Okay, I don't know if, uh, if it will be very successful, but it could be a beginning of a conversation or a total stopper. So, uh, so it's all this activity that's going on all the time that influences matter. And uh, then I come back to the droplet, and then why did I talk about the droplet? Jean-Marie Lenn talked about intermolecular interactions, supermolecular chemistry. Part of that is these van der Waals forces, forces that keep molecules together. That's why a droplet forms and doesn't just fly apart, okay, water. And the cohesive forces here, one of the forces, that are, there are several of these, one of them is actually these driven by these fluctuations. So if I turned it off, maybe this droplet would fall apart. So knowing that these things have such a, these fluctuations and these have so much uh, impact on properties, I question myself, we could use this to enhance it, can we, put, can we make it stronger and modify the properties of matter? And it turns out you can. To do that, you have to put matter in an optical, some kind of resonator. And even in the dark, an optical resonator is excited by these, these, uh, fluctu these virtual photons or these fluctuations that keep on jiggle inside. And you can make the interaction very strong. To, to understand that, it is called in, in the quantum electrodynamics, is called strong coupling regime, and I'm going to uh, show you what happens. So to show that, I have to go back to couple something that was understood in 1650 by Huygens, the same Dutch physicist, and he gave us the pendula clock. So pendula clocks, was the, the pendula has a natural frequency, and that frequency, that oscillation, the natural oscillation stabilizes the clock, and it was the first time in history of mankind that we had stable clocks. And this was critical for navigation at the time. That's why it happened in the Netherlands, because they were doing commerce with the rest of the world. And, and, uh, and they could see where they were in sea, and it reduced the number of boats that went hit, hit, you know, hit rocks and so forth, because they suddenly didn't know where they were. And uh, using clocks, just like GPS today is driven by atomic clocks. And so, um, 
the I want to show you coupled oscillators. So he solved the problem. And so he had more than one pendular clock in his, in his workshop, and he noticed that it got synchronized, and he solved this problem of coupled oscillators. So I'm going to show you this on the left-hand side, and the right-hand side I'll show you a modern version of this. So now I need sound. Louder, please. Okay. So here you have these, these oscillators, pendula, ground, then vibrate one side, vibrate the other. And here you have five metronomes doing the same thing. Now, is that magic or not? I find that always beautiful to see, and I can see on your faces that you also enjoy this, because you can hear it and see it. That's why I like to show it. And so they are all synchronizing, it. and I actually done this in a music store. My wife is a musician, and we have a friend who has a music store, and I did a thing with two of them, and they thought it was magic. He thought it was magic. But actually, it's just science. That's solved by Huygens in 1650. So I'm not going to get back to it. I'm going to stop that, but I can this. What happens is that they, they, when they move together, they actually lower their energy, and nature always likes lower energy. That's why you roll down a mountain. That's where you can go skiing. So if, it, and it nice, if nature didn't like that, you would stand on a ski slope and you wouldn't move. So it's kind of problematic. So here's the, it's the same thing. This is a lower energy level when they move together. And there's actually the opposite when they move like this. And of course, that you never see in an experiment like that. So the, the, why I'm showing you this is because you can do the same thing between an optical resonance and a material resonance. I showed you material resonance before with colors of, of molecules. And so you imagine a red color here, and then I make an optical resonator that also resonates in the red. And I make sure that they absolutely have the same, uh, the same uh, energy, these, trans these two states, the separation here is the same energy. And then in the dark, they start talking to each other. That's what's truly amazing. And why do they talk to each other? Because they're exchanging these little funny virtual photons that I talked about. But now, inside the resonator, I enhance them at a one given frequency. I don't have them all over the space. The one, I can exclude ones that are occurring all around the room, but just the ones that I want are tuned to, the, are tuned to this resonance, get enhanced. And they start exchanging virtual photons or fluctuations. And I get new states, and now I get these hybrid light matter states. And I can tell you, if, you're, if you wonder what I'm talking about, well, even scientists find this hard to understand. Okay, so this is, this is because this is sort of, even to me, I don't quite know what these things are, but I play with them. And so, how do I do the experiment? So, you can make a resonator by having two mirrors. So, you take two mirrors that are totally opaque, that you could buy commercially, and you look at yourself in the mirror, I put this mirror between you and me, and you cannot see anything. I cannot see you, you cannot see me. Then I put another mirror very close by, and suddenly I can now see you and you can see me at very given wavelengths. Maybe red, maybe green, I can see each other. Seems totally unintuitive, but this is how optics work. And I won't go into why, but this is how you make an optical resonator. That's how lasers are made and so forth. This laser has such mirrors, otherwise it wouldn't be lasing. And so I have these two mirrors that are parallel. I spin coat molecules on this, on this thing and make sure the distance between the mirrors is such that the frequency at which these molecules absorb light is the same as the resonance between these two mirrors. And when I do that, the material changes color. And it goes, in this case, from green to, to orange. And I've just changed the color of the material because I made new energy levels in the material. And any chemist, all chemists and physicists know that if you, the energy levels of a material determines its property. Determines whether the thing is liquid, solid, at room temperature, the color of your, everything that you're wearing. And, and so here, if you see this and that, if you're, this is a, called a spectrum, if you see this change, you know immediately that you have changed the material. It could have been the same. If, you, if I hadn't told you that it was a cavity and I showed this to a chemist, he would say, oh, these are not the same molecules. And indeed, they aren't. And this is where I come in, because I thought, if you can do this, then you can change just about anything. And you can change just about, just about anything. 
uh, with this approach. I'll, well, I can just, I don't know how much time, how much time I'm doing fine? Not so well, okay. So, uh, so you have a reactive landscape, so now I have to explain a little bit about chemistry. So a landscape, a chemical reaction, for example, the vision in your eye, involves, in the, if, if you didn't have any light, there would be a barrier here for the molecule to switch shape. And this height of this mountain is a barrier which is luckily necessary, otherwise all chemical reactions would occur all the time and you would probably burn up. Uh, but the job of a chemist is to f find an efficient way to get across this. That's why you, the reason you heat up a sample is to get across a barrier like this, a mountain. And you have heard about catalysts maybe, but there's a lot of research done to make catalysts, which are molecules that, or materials that lower this barrier so that the energy cost is smaller. So industry is always looking for making a drug to make lower the barrier to footprint and today's environmental issues, this is critical. And the second thing is you can use these, you can shape this landscape, this chemical landscape to increase the yields. And so we did, uh, we, we tried to do this using these resonators, molecules inside the resonator. And so we did this by having, now we talk, we are, all, I should say something, all molecules and very important in chemistry is that all molecules vibrate like mad. The water in your, everything in your face now and everywhere in your head and your body is vibrating. Okay? Water vibrates in a cup, you don't see it, but it is. And you can see this by doing, using spectroscopy techniques. And water has very simple modes. So this is bending mode and stretching modes. This is just to show you some very simple samples. And they do this at specific frequencies. So now, uh, I want to use such a frequency, such vibrations of more complicated molecules. And I'm going to put this between two mirrors. Here are the images of images, and I'm going to put some molecules, and I'm going to try to do a change, modify a chemical reaction by having this, these fluctuations here, these virtual photons, interact with these vibrations. And it, this is done in something very simple. It's just two metallic, uh, two mirrors inside this thing. This is commercially available, costs a few hundred euros. And with a screwdriver, I, I squash a little polymer layer that separates the two mirrors, and I can tune the cavity to be resonant with the vibration of the molecule. So I adjust the energy levels of the optical resonator. Now, uh, as I said in, in, in Prague, I like to show this, especially if there are physicists in the room, this is the, the world's simplest way of doing quantum science. This is so tiny, if you have ever seen a real quantum physics lab, this is very impressive. This is the poor man's, the chemistry version. So I show this to tease them. Anyway, so I use this cavity and I want to now show that I can tilt the reaction towards one product or another. This is very important, as I explained, for making drugs, for example, for pharmaceutical drugs. So can I favor one, re one, re comp one, react one product versus another? And that means that there are two, two, two mountains to cross, one for this one and one for that. And can I change this, the, the interplay between these, the relative ratio? Of course, if I show it to you, it's because I can. And here I show, this is a proof of principle, that I can switch from product one to product two. Here's, I start with 60% of one, and when I induce this interaction with this nothingness, I generate much more, two, 80% two. And this is only for chemists. Here, uh, or maybe, no, it could be for, even for music, all these little peaks here indicate vibrational frequencies, like notes on a, on a piano. And you can see that only some notes make a change. Every time the red line reaches, follows a peak, it means it has an effect. All the other ones play no role. This is kind of amazing too, also. Anyway, so you can change just about any property we have tried, or we and other people around the world have tried. You can change it with this approach. This is a new way to modify materials that has taken us nine, this quantum electron dynamics, in a few years will have a hundred years old. It's taken us sort of 90 years to understand this, to digest it, to make use of it. And this is typical of many understanding concepts and knowledge. And you can do a lot of different things. And so I will come to the end. So, of course, strong coupling with the vacuum field. I hope I convinced you that there has a lot of meaning for our existence, from nature. 
There are centers on this topic being set up in the US and Europe, and since we are talking, since US is always the Europe's sort of challenger, I can tell you that the Americans are trying to catch up with this, and there's an agency called DARPA, which is the military version of NSA, which most of you have heard about NSA because of all these spy candles and so forth. DARPA is the, uh, defines the strategy and gave us the internet, for example. Okay, without their funding, there would have been no internet. Without their funding, there might not have been much about mRNA either. So, uh, vaccines. So, they last year they decided that they would fund this type of research that we started. Uh, to make America catch up with us. So, for once we are ahead of the game. And there's also industry interested, and I would like to end by saying that I can, the fun thing for me as a scientist is having all these young people who do the work and make my life every day very enjoyable. Thank you. Would you like to ask Tom Everson? You understood everything? There? You explained everything. I'm amazed. Impressive Bruno crowd. <laughs> That's absolutely perfect, you know? Yeah. Absolutely wise, perfect. You're happy with the timing? No. <laughs> we are 30 it's minutes late. But I think we will... Will you stay with us for 15 more minutes? Do I can ask all three our distinguished guests to join us on stage? I will prepare seats for you. So please take a seat. Jean Marie, could you join us? Thomas, please take a seat. I will give you the seats to you can ask some questions that you are interested in, please. And give you the microphones so we can hear you. Which color do you prefer? I have one. Which color? Which color? You can choose the color. All three. All three, okay. <laughs> okay. Speaking as a chemist. Green one, yeah. I can use this too, but and you can use. Yes. Do you do you prefer the black one or the orange one? Because I might change the color of this one. So. Do you want to change the color? No, I'll stay with the black. Okay, one. Okay, we'll stay with the black one. Cool. You left me with the orange one. I will use this one. Okay. <laughs> I would like to start with a question, if you allowed. If you have any questions, please just raise your hand. Don't hesitate at all and ask the questions you are interested in. But if you allow it, I would like to start with a quote of Jean-Marie, who said, young scientists should be modest but proud. How to balance the modesty and the proudness? Modesty and, and proudness. Yes. No. I think we have to be modest because there are lots of things we don't know and proud of what we know. And how should a young scientist who is starting his or her career balance the modesty and balance the self-confidence that is needed? Not think research? about and just work on it. Well, pretty simple. <laughs> Pride is not really a good recipe for a successful scientific career. Well, you mentioned the ignorance, that the ignorance is helping a lot. <laughs> but your trademark is not only ignorance, as you would call it, because I would not, honestly. But it's multidisciplinary and curiosity. In how many fields have you been working in, in your career? Four different, four different uh, topics. This is my fourth topic, what I showed you today. Four different topics? Different, f f quite different topics, yeah. From the perspective of economist, is this economical attitude? In terms of uh, research style, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think people are quite different. You have to find your own research style. Some people actually always work in the same topic and dig, dig it very deep. Yeah. Some others like to do lots of different things. I'm, I'm one of those, but I don't think there's a better way to do no, it. Absolutely. I mean, it's, Everybody it's really has to do their own way. Yeah. And do not be alarmed if I'm not successful in one field and do not be stressed out that I can change the field. Is that right? No, I okay. think you just, you, know, you have to, we are different. So we have a different way of thinking. Mm -hmm. I like logical deductions, one from the other, and generalizations. So uh, a new thing can come out of an earlier one by a new attitude, looking at it from a different point of view. So I think it's very different. Depends on the field also. Definitely so, yeah. You can see, yeah. you can see that uh, uh, they, the experiment like the, uh, the discovery of the gravity waves. Mm -hmm. This is something which was predicted 
So you have to see it, you have to get it. And this was a very hard, hard work yeah. for doing an experiment which was un which is unbelievable. In fact, it's so unbelievable that I still wonder whether it's true or not. <laughs> but it, it's, it's an in incredible experiment, pushing like, things to the limit. Yeah, it took 50 years. Huh? Well, it's like yeah, the same different. scientists worked on this for 50 years to get there. Mm -hmm. This really takes dedication, what Jean was talking about and what you need. So you need scientists like that mm -hmm. and you need other scientists who might want to change field. Mm -hmm. uh, what you always need to do is you need her curiosity, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, that drives all of us. And when Barry Barish and Kip Tone started working on the necessary equipment for the gravitational wave detection, they came and asked for the money and said, this will not come to a ground, brew, ground breakthrough, uh, this will not come to a breakthrough. This will not be the one that will make the discovery. We need this amount of money, a huge amount of money, just to make the first step. And after that, after 20 years, we will come up with the new equipment that will actually make the discovery. That's why it took so long. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's how it happened. It requires governments that fund this kind of thing. Yes. The, com the common good. For common good, was it? Well, for, for psychologists, uh, something which is very important is to have a little bit of uh, over-optimism in, in terms of self-confidence. So, a little bit of self-confidence is good because it gives you the energy to try. You know, you, you think you are going to see it. You should not have too much self-confidence because otherwise you'll never learn from your mistakes, of course. But that's an important thing. The other thing which I found important and my colleagues find important is to do wishful thinking at some point, which, mm -hmm. but knowing that you're doing wishful thinking. So you have this goal, you have this, uh, this target that you are trying to reach and you hope it's true somehow. And you know, of course, many times you find out that <laughs> it's not true, but you know, still next time you step, and at some point you find it's true, but you have to also, be, again, you should be not too optimistic. You should be a bit optimistic, <laughs> over optimistic. If you are not an optimist, you might as well stop now. <laughs> That's the perspective on research and at the beginning of the research. I would like to talk about teachers and the importance of teachers. There are teachers in this room who maybe are thinking how to make sure that one of these students will become a Kavli Prize laureate, a Nobel Prize laureate. Could you tell us more about Richard Schoenmaker and Norman Craig? Tell me. Okay. So I, as I explained, I was not a very good student and uh, I came to the United States to a small college and in America, most people know the universities, Harvard, MIT and so forth, but actually there are 2,000 small colleges that only teach until uh, the bachelor's degree. And that's, that's where the name, they get the name college for. And those also have various ranks that people abroad don't know about. And I, by chance, was admitted into a very good one because I had been a uh, sailor. And, uh, and while I was there, I had no intention of studying chemistry. And, uh, and uh, that was the last topic I wanted. I liked actually physics, as you can see from my talk. I like physics. And, uh, but I didn't think I was good enough in math to do that, so I did biology. But then when I did biology, then my advisor said, well, you need chemistry to do biology. What Jean-Marie was talking about, the foundations of biology is chemistry. And so I did chemistry and I hated that, organic chemistry, the worst possible course. <laughs> and, uh, and then my advisor said, yes, unfortunately, sorry to say for me, this was just, I couldn't understand the logic of it. Of course, if you're Jean-Marie Lenn, you know the logic of it, but I didn't, couldn't see it. And then, uh, and maybe the teachers I had. And so, and then the, my advisor said, um, you should take one more course and then you get a chemistry major and then you can use this in your biology, it would be very helpful. And I said, what do I have to take? You have to take physical chemistry. Okay, physical chemistry, if you were in my day, hey day, that was considered the most difficult course in the whole college. And so I go into this class and I have these two professors, one after the other, in the first semester and within, I don't know, a month or two months, I decide I want to be a physical chemist because this, these professors were just unbelievably good. One explained all the energetics, why they're hills and why you slide down a hill, and the other one explained quantum mechanics and in such a way that I understood enough to really be amazed at what was underlying chemistry. And suddenly all the chemistry I hadn't understood made some sense to me, not all of it, I must say, but enough. So I ended up being a chemist, which I didn't want to be, thanks to these two 
amazing professors. So teachers make a huge difference. Why was they amazing? What made them amazing? Uh, what made them amazing? They had ways they understood what they were teaching really well. So they were not faced by questions, un unbearable questions from students. They, if they didn't know the answer, they would go back and think about it and come back the following week and tell us what they thought was the answer. And they spent a lot of time preparing the courses, even though they had taught it for many years. You never went to disturb them just before they had to teach physical chemistry because they were re thinking about everything they were going to say to make it very clear and very accessible to us. Mm -hmm. And that was inspiring. They knew they were teaching something hard, and, but they, they were gentle with us. Jean, you have been raised in, as you called it, quote, an exam intensive environment. Could you compare this experience to the experience you had while you were studying at MIT and it was your third year at MIT? Maybe I should say a little bit about my background. I come from a very privileged family, but I didn't know what I wanted to do, so I was good at school, and I went into math and physics because that was not because I'd, I'd, I wanted to do that necessarily, but that was a way to be in a good class mm -hmm. in France here to be to be doing that. I liked history and philosophy and the like, but uh, uh, then there was a math teacher. I mean, the first big step actually at a math and physics teacher who kind of believed in me and said, you're not going to be a doctor like your, your father was, <laughs> and you know you, you should be a mathematician or physicist. So I went to study math and physics, and in there I, I discovered uh, economics, and I found that very interesting. I probably would not have been a top mathematician or physicist. I love those those fields, but you know, whereas economists mm -hmm. kind of resonated with me more. And then I went to MIT to get a PhD because I was a good student, but you know I was passing exams. I, I didn't know, I was absolutely not creative at all. You know, I didn't know how to ask a question. I, I, I knew how to solve issues, problems that, that I knew how to do very easily, but you know, really asking questions, the right question, which is actually the most difficult thing to do in research. I was totally unable to do that. And then I went to MIT. I was lucky to get an advisor who was three years older than I was, who got the Nobel Prize too, and was very generous with his time. Mm -hmm. And especially, in, I never worked on his topics. Actually, my friends who uh, were classmates were working with him. They didn't work on his topics either. It's a bit different from uh, experimental fields where you need labs and you need to have some coherency in the lab. But in economics or mathematics, you can work on anything you want. In a sense, there's no equipment or very little equipment. And this very generous person actually accepted, and not all professors are like that, but we accepted, to, you know, we, I could work on totally different things. And then, you know, this, it took me a, little, a while, actually, to, to learn how to ask a good question. You know, and that's really the difficult part. If you come from a system like mine, where you are trained to pass exams, then there is this step, which <laughs> you need enough energy to, to move on and, and, and be able to ask the right question. Then it's half of the research, which is in this question. Can you rely a good student? Can you rely a good student liking the tests? You know, that's something you did not experience at all. I mean, the kind of experience you had at MIT is uh, typical of the, I mean, it's more of US than mm. in Europe at that period, at least. And, uh, and Do I you feel it's changing that the style of teaching, that the style of education is getting more and more often in the universities of Europe? I think so. No? I yeah, we, we try, we try, but it's, it's still a long way to go, I think, compared to the US. The US is, insists much more on, on creativity. And sometimes the knowledge actually is not as good, actually, but in terms of creativity, mm -hmm. it's actually quite, quite good for that. And we, we have to take some of that. Mm -hmm. Please tell me the one piece of advice you should have received when you were starting your scientific career and you didn't receive it. What would that piece of advice be, Jean-Marie? I think you have to pay attention to everything around. What I was interested in is uh, just really learning more, curiosity mm -hmm. of knowledge. And uh, I was at Harvard for my postdoc. 
it's not it's a special place but it's not the only place in the world but in all areas especially in chemistry but also biology there are people of very high level so if you want to learn you just go from one lab to another and you talk with them and i think at that time i was probably as a young and nothing postdoctoral fellow the one who knew more, more about what others were doing than the other people and i think i wanted to learn i wanted to learn i studied quantum mechanics at that time because i wanted to know what it is i wanted also to prove to myself that i could understand it <laughs> <laughs> how long did it take to prove it to yourself that you can understand it i i followed the course that's all and I noticed okay. <laughs> that I could understand the course. Yeah. John Waldefield, in fact, he used the French book, The Messiah, Quantum Mechanics by uh, the Messiah. Uh, he was a Swiss of origin and he taught that. And then I had a good friend, Rolf Hoffman, who got the Nobel Prize also. And uh, so he, uh, he was my very good friend. I bet he was doing computing. I didn't know computing. I said, okay, Rolf, tell me what are you doing? How do you do that? Mm -hmm. And so this is, I think, when you are in conditions like that, you should take advantage of everything around. There were good brains, there were good talks, you had everything you could just learn. And then, uh, but you know, the other thing is also, they also have just uh, something where by chance something happens. I think I was also, you are not the only one who was a bad student. Huh? Okay. Okay. I, know this <laughs> I was learn something every day. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we were, know what happened is that uh, you, at some stage, you sort of want to learn more. Mm. And for me, it was I remember that very well. We had to bicycle to the to the college, uh, which was the high school, uh, ten, five kilometers away from where I was born. And there was a friend who was two years ahead of me. Mm -hmm. So when he was in the uh, last years of where they were teaching philosophy, he told me about what they were learning. And so I began to read Kant, Freud, Nietzsche. And I said, this is interesting. This is a total mind opener. Mm -hmm. I have not become a disciple of any of those. But it's a mind opener. You have mm -hmm. big questions, and then you get the taste for it. Huh? Yeah. You get the taste. John. Yes. Once you have tasted it, you continue. Yeah. Exactly. Well, well, once you start eating, you will go on. Okay, John. <laughs> yeah, it comes by eating. Yeah. Yeah. Try different things, and for many reasons. First, find your what you like. I mean, I was telling Daniel, uh, my first class in economics was when I was 21 or 22, so pretty late. So, you know, if you, if you try different things, it's useful. But also, later on, you may want to work at the broader of other disciplines, so having a broad culture is actually very useful. And I think for that, again, the, the system like the French system is not always a good one, because very early on, at the age of 17, you specialize, you decide you're going to become a doctor, you're going to become a lawyer, or whatever, and then you are, you know, it's for your life somehow. And I don't think it's optimal. The experience of Thomas at, at, at Oberlin College is a good example of that, where, you know, you try different things, you find what you like, and, and so on. That's very, very, very important. And the second advice is really uh, try to find, you know, be in the right place at the right moment. So, Something I find, again, comparing France and the US, something I found is that in France, most students are completely uninformed about where exciting work is being done, you know, where they should be going within France or abroad. Um, whereas in the US, I saw the students moving around before they choose, for example, a graduate prime and you're know, asking, is this person going to stay and still be there next year and, and so on, and looking at the entire dynamics just to make sure that so there's a very different attitude uh, between countries on this on this front mm. Let me t there's a story which you might like which has to do with you can be successful from any anywhere you come in fact there would be two stories but let me first mention one of them 
There's a very top chemist, Stuart Schreiber, who is now the co-director of a very famous institute, the Broad Institute, a biological institute, which is combining Harvard and MIT, which is rather good level. Huh? So Stuart, he is a good friend. He was a credit student when I was giving some lectures at Harvard in the 70s. So Stuart, who is a molecular biologist and uh, in, in, in genetics, so that is, one day he said, oh, I will have my DNA done. I want to know where I come from. So he was one of the very top scientists in the US. So he had his DNA done. And you can read the story in the Harvard magazine. You can even find it now on the internet. What do you find out? In some ways, you would find it shocking, but it's a very nice, good lesson that you can succeed from anywhere you come. He found out that his real father was not the one he thought was. That he was living, in fact, very funnily, the same street, but 10 houses further down the street, number one. Number two, his grandmother was a prostitute. Number three, his, uh, that family, I think it was maybe his grandfather, was, um, how do you call these guys, you know, who were distilling alcohol in the prohibition times? Yeah, yeah. They were uh, in the prohibition Black times markets. in the US. Uh, yeah. And he had been doing jail because he had been distilling alcohol. So Stuart, he wanted to write this down. You can read it because it sort of gives you the example that it depends on you. Huh? Of course, you have genes, you have also genes, but it's impossible. It's really important what you do. It's, a fan, it's quite a fantastic story. Huh? I, I talk about it usually, and he did it on purpose so that one can talk about the fact that you, anywhere you come from, you can be successful. Yeah. But the barrier is probably slightly different depending on which environment you're in, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's true. Yes, I don't know exactly what the environment it was later on. Yeah. Uh, that's something, yeah, it's in the paper also. I don't yeah, remember yeah. exactly what was his direct. Uh, yeah. But his direct father was not the one he thought was his father. Huh? But now he's good friends with the real one. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't go into more detail. Yeah. <laughs> Thomas, the piece of advice you should have received? Well, I think every, I agree with everything both of Jean and Jean-Marie have said, and I don't know what I can add. I, I, think, I think the importance of liking what you're doing is absolutely essential. You kind of, I love physics, and that's obvious. I moved gradually back. I started in chemistry. And I sort of got into chemistry via physical chemistry, and then I've been drifting back to physics, whether I like it or whether I, you know, unknowingly, because unconsciously it's what I really like. And I think in a huge ingredient for a successful career as a scientist is curiosity. You need to catch things. You need to be ready to accept things that you don't, aren't written in the books and uh, catch the things that pass in front of you when you see it. And, you know, do not be scared of dealing with the unknown. So hard work, mostly it's hard work, curiosity and a bit of luck. The meritocracy issues that Jean was talking about. Thomas Ebersen, Jean Maglai, Jean Tirol. Thank you very much Thank indeed. You. Daniel. One other story about this. <laughs> you all got vaccinated, yes? You got probably the RNA vaccine, the BioNTech Pfizer. Mm -hmm. That is also a story like that. There was a lady, Katalin Kariko, Hungarian, who believed in what that RNA was important. She got a position at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Because she didn't get money, she was almost, she was almost thrown out of the university. Then she got together with, a, with a, his, her colleagues and they made this thing happen because they changed. It was basically chemistry, but okay, forget about that. Then, at the risk of being thrown out of the university, uh, the guys in Germany, BioNTech, the, the, uh, um, Sahin, Ugu Sahin, he said, okay, come to see, come with us. You are vice president of our company. These two people, Sahin and uh, Oslem Turishi, they are two people of Turk 
Turkish origin. So, the people who made a, make a vaccine in less than a year were a Hungarian, an American, two Turks. Who could have predicted that? So, no discrimination, everything is possible. Yeah. Can I, then I want to add one word. <laughs> I just want to add nothing to do with this, but I'm going to say what I meant. You're really lucky in, in Czech Republic because you have a TV station with a man like Daniel. <laughs> and, <laughs> you, you might think that's normal. There are zero hours of science programs in French TV. Okay? And in my native country, you, you have a negative version of this. You have people who still believe, <laughs> school teachers who still believe that atoms is some construct of scientists, a mental construct. So you can imagine a barrier. Yes, I know people are surprised at that, but believe me, that's the case. So you, have the, you are very lucky to be in a, a, an enlightened situation like that. So thank you, Daniel. No, thank you, you are most kind. We didn't plan that, this was not sketched. So. <laughs> that's why I'm red like a lobster. So. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. So I would also like to thank you very, very much for your exciting talks, for your visit, and for sharing with us your scientific and personal experience. And uh, I believe that the Friday evening is not ending, and I would like to uh, invite all of you, you of course, and all, all of you, uh, to spend some time with us in the Garden of Eden, just in the monastery behind this room. And we can still have some drinks and refreshment, and I believe the talks could continue for some while. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And thank you very much for taking part in uh, Sounds of Science 2022. I do hope you enjoyed it. I do hope uh, you feel enlightened. I do hope you learn something new and you will have even more passion for science. It doesn't matter which field of expertise are you working on. It's science and there's only one in the whole world. Thank you very much indeed. Have a great day.